All right, so this is the history and future of crash dumps and FreeBSD. Uh, I'm Sam Gwider. Uh, here's a link to the repo that houses the paper and slides if you want them. Okay, so a little bit about me. Uh, I'm Sam Gwider. I recently graduated from Texas A&M uh, last May. Uh, I used to work for Groupon where I worked on their FreeBSD boxes. That's what this talk is mostly about. And then now I work at Joyent where I don't work on much FreeBSD, but I'm FreeBSD adjacent. <laughs> um, I've used Unix-like systems for a little over 12 years. Uh, first OpenBSD and then later FreeBSD for the past five. Um, and so I wanted to give a little bit background about this talk because the first time I gave it, I gave it without these next two slides and Kirk McCusick's first question. He raised his hand and I was like, oh, this would be a great question. He was like, what would make someone do this? <laughs> <laughs> if, you, if you see the paper, it's, it's pretty extensive. So I'd like to explain, explain my story. Um, so my previous job ran many FreeBSD machines and they tended to crash sometimes. And when it did crash, um, I would get a ticket that said like, Sam, go diagnose this thing. So I went to go look, and I was like, oh, I'll go find the crash dumps. There were no crash dumps. So the log showed the crash dumps were larger than the swap space, and the dumps were thus very large, over 32 gigs, and sometimes 64, depending on the machine. Um, and then, in fact, some of the swap partitions were missing altogether. And there was a bug in the pr original provisioning script, and I was not in a position where I could go format every single machine, so I had to figure out how can I get crash dumps without a swap partition, or just a very small swap partition relative to the dump size? And there's a second layer of why. Uh, before I graduated, I was in a technical writing seminar, and we needed a paper, and it needed to be of a certain length. So at, around the same time, I found the Unix history repo, which is, if you've seen this, it's a Git repo that merges the history of FreeBSD sort of backwards all the way into like research Unix through 386 BSD, um, all the different versions. And um, so I wrote a paper detailing how a crash dump was made, and then when it turned out it needed to be a bit longer, I expanded that into a history of how the crash dump worked. Um, so it turned out understanding how crash dumps worked was crucial to solving my missing swap partition problem. Um, deciding on a solution and avoiding reinventing the wheel was important. Unix history is always fun, which I thought was funny from the last uh, presentation that he said, kids aren't interested in Unix history, and a kid comes up and does Unix history. Um, so what's a crash dump? A uh, crash dump is a machine-readable form of the state of a machine at some point in time, usually after a panic. And so for a human, a crash dump would be like, if you made a mistake and you did something embarrassing, you could be like, what was I thinking? And you'd actually have a list of exactly what you were thinking and go point out like, oh, it's because I thought this. <laughs> okay, so the history. Um, I like to call this the odyssey of do, do a dump. That's the function that sort of carries us through and that I would see scope for for every single version of BSD. Um, we start at 6th edition Research Unix uh, in their Crash 8 man page. And then it ends at FreeBSD 12 Currents Encrypted Dump. I don't know if that's ever going to make it into 11. Do we know? Probably just 12. Um, so in the, in the paper, um, you can go to the appendix for that extended history I wrote, and it includes a lot of things by like a side effect. So it includes like architecture support, different features that are relevant to the core dump code, and feature changes and larger bug fixes. Um, for even more depth, the PDF is like the clean version that you can read through, and then if you go to GitHub and go to the org mode file. That's actually like the version I worked from. I exported the PDF. It includes notes, includes commits, mailing list emails, and um, a lot of code from different code bases for like OS X, Lumos, um, different versions of Unix. 
So you can, it's really extensive. You can go find whatever you want related to this topic. This is one of my favorite quotes when I was talking to Rod for help. He said, well, in 1979, I can remember doing a crash dump on a Harris S210 24-bit machine to the line printer in Octal, and it only took two hours to print. <laughs> I guess that was an improvement. Um, so we, we, this talk ends up being a talk about like, the output format of, of core dumps. And so we can see that like, originally you just used a line printer. Then later you could dump to magnetic tape when Unix came around. And the original Unix code, you, you dump to a tape. Um, next is paging area or swap. And then this is dashed out because it never made it to um, base. But there's net dumping. So you can dump over the network to another machine. At, or, and then that was added around 2000, but it never actually made it into base, which a lot of these core dump extensions, I call them, tend to do, or tend to not do, I guess. Um, so there's lots of these different extensions. In particular, the net dump, and I, I need to revise the state. It actually started around 2000, um, and it has never made it into FreeBSD. Uh, the next was mini dump by Peter Wem. So you only dump. Um, pages that are in memory when, when your machine panics. Then next is a text dump. It was around 2008. And then lately there's been a bunch more because machines are getting a whole lot more RAM and uh, the swap space is not growing in tandem, right? So you might want to compress the dump so you can fit that dump into RAM. Um, encrypted dump is the most recent one that made it into base. And then Rod Grimes is working on two things. Uh, modular dump, so take these different features and modularize them so you can mix and match as an admin. And then the last one's pretty cool, and it was a tool I used at Groupon. So it's mini dump size. You can load a kernel module that will tell you, it'll give you a new syscatol, and then you can like use the syscatol to ask, hey, if I panicked right now, how large would the dump be? Because that was what I used to, to determine if, if I were to format my machines at Groupon, how large would this swap be? It turned out that number was ridiculous, so I had to figure out something else. OK, so a general overview of the uh, d different dump procedures for FreeBSD. Um, but first, I can tell you how to do one at home. Uh, I do have to caution you. I am sure everyone here knows what you're about to do, but you're purposely panicking your machine if you want to take a crash dump and take a look around. So definitely do this in a VM, or just do it Raise your hand if your machine crashes. <laughs> um, yeah, right. It'll probably work. Um, so if, if you want to take that dump right now, you, you should be set up by default. But if you're not, you can take these first three steps. Um, but really, the last step should, should really, that's the kicker. <laughs> so do that one. You'll, you'll, you'll get the intended result. OK, so the general dump procedure. So this is before many dump. So this is not what most people are doing now, but this is the procedure that all of these generally follow. So most OS at least have this kind of functionality. But basically, you take what's in RAM after a panic. You dump everything through a function called dumpsys. It dumps it out to, this is a, the default swap partition, um, the second partition. You reboot. Then a program runs called save core. It takes what's in swap, reads it out, and if it's um, valid, it'll, it'll read it into slash var slash crash. Um, here's some other fun ways you can cause a panic. If you want to do it with dtrace and be fancy, there it is. Um, so yeah, dump sys lands all, all the parts, of, all or part of memory on swap, and then on reboot, that's where you get your file out of swap. So what's in a core dump? Um, there's three types of core dumps in FreeBSD, so this answer actually varies. But um, for full dumps and mini dumps, they're similar. Uh, there's three parts. There's an info file, which is metadata about the dump. Probably the first thing you go check is like when it happened, what machine, what machine name it was, and what panic string was was spat out by the kernel. Um, next is core.txt, which is like every diagnostic you can think of one after the next, and that can help you figure out what happened. 
um, or what was going on at the time, and then VM core, which is like literally the memory. That's what you push into your kernel debugger. So the full dump on disk format is, is displayed here. Um, you'll notice that it's actually shifted to the right, right? So it's, it's at the end of the swap partition, not at the beginning where you'd expect maybe it would be written out. Uh, the reason for this is on your reboot, uh, FSCK might, might use swap or other things might use swap. And so we're basically hedging our bet that no one will write over our dump while, while rebooting before we can run save core. Um, so this is the, a classic core dump. So that means the, the full contents of memory at the time of the crash, these can be very large, or just as large as your RAM. Uh, they're in ELF format, so they're just a binary. Uh, previous to FreeBSD 6.0, they were a dot out format. And um, I don't have a dot out format, but I do have ELF in the paper, so you can read about that if you'd like. Um, but yeah, so, so the, the format is inside the leader and trailer, it's exactly the same as a binary. The leader and trailer, though, are, are, are data about the uh, dump itself. So the mini dump on disk format is a little different. It's actually not a binary. Uh, this was introduced by Peter Wem in um, FreeBSD 6.2. Contains only memory pages in use by the kernel, so probably all the relevant um, memory to diagnose your problem that caused the crash. Uh, the purpose of this is to have something that's much smaller than the full contents of memory. Modern dumps can still be fairly large because we have tons of RAM and tons of things in, in memory at any given time. But uh, hopefully this will make it smaller. And so the mini dump format is not an ELF. It's this custom mini dump format. And so it's got a different, different set of, uh, of parts. And it, it includes like a, an extra header to explain how, how the mini dump uh, is laid out and what parts of memory did get dumped out and what parts didn't. The third kind is a text dump. Uh, this is different than the other two. It's not really a core dump. It's, it's something sort of core dump adjacent, I guess. Um, so the text dump facility allows the capture of kernel debugging information to disk in a human readable rather than machine readable format. Um, and it's normally used, or then the machine readable format normally used with kernel memory dumps and, and mini dumps. Uh, these were added by Robert Watson in FreeBSD 7.1. Um, so the tech, text dump contents includes a few more files, they're all text files. Um, so the version, the panic string, the message buffer. Um, so that's what you get if you like ran dmessage right before your, your um, crash. Um, the kernel configuration and then captured DDB output. So that's the configurable part of the text dump. You can say, you can have an entire DDB script that you can write out all the relevant parts of uh, diagnostic info that you'd like, and then that will be dumped out on crash. Uh, you do have to know what you're looking for. That's sort of the trade-off between text dumps and uh, core dump, is, is that if you know what you're looking for, you can use a text dump, and you'll like, kind of get exactly that information, and you'll be good to go. But if you don't know what you're looking for and your machine just crashed, you might want to core dump instead, because then you'll have everything there and you can figure it out yourself later. Um, the text dump on, on disk format is similar to the others, except in that it's written to the end. But it's actually just a tar of these six different text files, or these five, and, and then that same leader and header, or leader and trailer. Um, the text dump is, is written slightly differently because it doesn't know how large it's going to be ahead of time. Um, but that just is sort of an implementation detail. Um, cool, OK. And so there's, let's compare and contrast the core dumps versus text dumps. So they're both useful when crashes aren't predicted so in production. Um, operators can debug crashes offline, which is nice. It allows you to put your machine back online in production. Um, it allows archiving of crash data later for comparison. Um, core dumps, you don't need to know what you're looking for ahead of time, which is nice, because you don't always know when your machines crash and why they crash. Actually, it's pretty impressive if you know every time why your machines crash. 
Um, and for core dumps, you need the source tree, debug symbols, and a build kernel for analysis. Whereas with text dumps, they're less complete, but much smaller, a few megabytes versus many gigabytes. And then sometimes easier to extract information using DDB over KGDB. Uh, other, other OSs and tools. So what other, what other features do other OSs have that we might want in FreeBSD? And can we port those, or should we port those features over? Um, there's two operating systems I'll cover, Mac OS and Illumos. And then as like a, an adjacent tool, um, backtrace.io helps you work with crash dumps. Okay, so OS 10, it's very different from the BSD core procedure, or core dump procedure. Um, first, it's Mako, the output format, so it's not ELF. And then oftentimes, like the default for OS 10 is remote core dumps, so net dumps. Um, you can do local dumps, but that's sort of like not, not the preferred way. Um, you can do them over the network or over Firewire. Um, net dump works using a, a program called KDumpD. Uh, it's a modified TFTPD from FreeBSD, so that's our connection. Um, and they also have compressed dump at the same time. They have gzip compression, and both local and remote dumps are, are gzip compressed. Uh, the full procedure is detailed in the paper in as much detail as the FreeBSD core dump procedure. Uh, Illumos is not a BSD at all, but the, the features are important because Illumos also has ZFS. There are some features we might want to steal. Um, so they have basically every feature we might want. Online dump size estimation. So it includes different calculations for all the settings I'm gonna list out below. So as you change settings, you can estimate online how big your dump is gonna be and figure out if this is something you know sane or something you want. Um, so if you turn on and off compression, you'll see like, oh, I get, you know, it estimates that I'll get uh, 2x compression. Um, so you can turn on and off gzip compression. Um, an important feature they have is that they're able to dump to a zvol, and, and that would actually, that's particularly the, the feature that interests me, because you can add a zvol after you've formatted a machine. You don't have to, you know, wipe out a machine to add a swap partition. You can add a zvol whenever you want. Um, and then the last one is live dump, which is, is pretty interesting. You can core dump on a production machine as it runs. It's useful for production machines where interactive debugging is not possible, especially for uh, debugging hangs. But it is kind of strange because it doesn't halt the system, so the dump is not consistent. If, if you're changing out pages, you might get this dump that's not really useful to you. But if you're debugging a hang, maybe that's what you need. Um, Backtrace.io is a tool for curating kernel and user space cores. Um, it, it'll, it takes a different format of, of a, it takes a core dump, then takes what's called a snapshot, which allows for debugging on a laptop or on an external machine instead of directly on a crash machine or a similar environment. Um, snapshots are even smaller than mini dumps by intelligently choosing which segments of a mini dump that are relevant. and allows for asking questions like, which panic is the most common in my data center? And then you can correlate by data center, storage controller, hard drive model, and timestamp. And so you can figure out where your crashes happen, when they happen, and then like what hardware may be causing them. And it can be really useful for, for managing a fleet of servers that may be crashing. Uh, there are several core dump extensions that I'd like to cover. Uh, first is modular core dump, so being able to choose the rest of these extensions like in different arrangements. Uh, net dump, mini dump sizing, compressed dump, stripe dump, and encrypted dump. So the modular dump code, um, this is something that's ongoing. Rod Grimes is working on this. Um, but so you can mix and match these features that I'm about to talk to talk about, um, which could be really useful if you, want, if you want compressed net dumps or something, or you don't want to compress them for some reason. You only want net dumps and spanning dumps. I don't know. So you can, you can customize which parts of this code you want, and that might be useful for making your kernel smaller if you're working on embedded systems. So the oldest um, net dump, or dump extension is net dump. It was started at Duke by a guy named Daryl Anderson. Um, I used to say this, 
was from around 2004, but Drew Gallatin, I think he's here somewhere. Um, what's up? He just stepped out. He just stepped out, okay. Um, corrected me at, at BSD Can, because I would always say, like, yeah, but this guy, this mysterious guy, Daryl Anderson, and this hand kind of shot up, and I'm like, I know him. <laughs> and, and he was like, I think it was about 2000. So I had to change from 2004 to 2000. Um, so this is 17-year-old code that's sort of been floating around and patched up, and it's still working at places like Isilon, but it, it traveled through Sandvine, now it's at Isilon. Um, it was almost part of FreeBSD 9.0. It's kind of got this interesting odyssey that it's like always almost there, and it never quite makes it into the kernel. Um, Mark Johnson is, is the current person I know working on it. Um, you can ping him for information. Um, I know he isn't working at Isilon. Um, mini dump sizing is a, an extension you can use to um, make an estimation of how large a mini dump will be. So this is like a small part of that online dump sizing estimation that Volumos has. Um, it works by just being like a no op version of the mini dump code. It's kernel module. It works for 10 and 11. Um, we're working on upstreaming it. I don't know actually the current status of it. Michael might know. Do you know? Do you know how Rod Grimes is doing? On uh, mini dump size, That's right. yeah, I've used it. I've used it in production. It works. Um, and then compressed dump. Compressed dump is interesting because there's sort of confusing terminology. Uh, even people that I've learned from don't confuse these two terms. Um, oh, and he misspelled dump as dumbs, <laughs> but. Um, so a lot of people think compressed dump is, is save core dash z, but it, it's a little bit confusing. So what I'm talking about when I say compressed dump it could be called maybe save compression or something like that, but not compressing from when you take from swap to your file system, that's save core dash z, but dump compression that I'm talking about is when you go from RAM to swap. Because if your swap partition is too small, you might want to compress as you go into swap. And so that feature is not yet here. Um, but yeah, so you, you gzip dump on, you gzip your dump on the fly before landing in swap. And this code exists, but it's not in the kernel. Um, the compression ratios are really high though because RAM is, is, is not, it's not compressed. Um, or it's highly compressible. You can get six to one or 14 to one compression ratios. So a 32 gigabyte core becomes 5.34 gigabytes. That's pretty nice. Um, fixing the patch so it'll apply after FreeBSD 12, after encrypted dump will take some work, but I think, I think that could still be done. Um, the last setup that's pretty interesting is stripe dump or spanning dump, I've seen it called. Um, a lot of setups have a small swap partition on each drive, and a large dump cannot fit in any, any single swap partition, so why not span the swap, swap partitions? Um, I guess this is a little outdated. I learned about this last night. This is a BSD can. But um, a spanning dump can dump across all your disks, and then when you run save cord, it'll, it'll rebuild it from each of the disks, and so you can have a larger effective swap size. Um, encrypted dump would be nice for, for sensitive data because kernel crash dumps can include a lot of like passwords and things like that that you might not want getting out, and especially if you want to pass it off to somebody else, you might want to encrypt it. Um, so you can encrypt it. it. Currently only supports AES 256 CBC, but I think, I think there's more, more things playing there. Um, the dump on man page is, is the examples are, are pretty great, so if you want to learn more about that, the man page is where to go. Um, you can see that the Procedure changes a little bit. After you save core to the dump directory, there's another step that has to take place, which is decrypt core that decrypts it with your, with your key. But otherwise, it's, it's exactly the same process. Um, the on-disk format is slightly altered from mini dump to allow for the, the key and key size are added to the uh, kernel dump header struct. Um, and then a kernel dump key consists of an algorithm identifier, an IV, and an encrypted symmetric key. Um, the panic string is shortened by four bytes to allow for this. So if your panic string is right at the edge there, you might have to shorten that one. Um, text dumps are not supported. Only full dumps and mini dumps can be encrypted right now. 
Um, this is not yet in the paper, but there's uh, mail going back and forth in the mailing list a couple years ago. And, and then there's a, a couple extensions that I'd like to, to propose. There were something I was intending to implement at Groupon, but that did not work out. Um, but dump to Zvol was the answer, and that's a feature from Alumos. Um, and I, I've been asking around who, who really wants live dump, because I think that's an interesting feature, but I, I can't see people, um, or I haven't been seen people like asking about it or wanting that, like, oh, I wish I could do this. It, it doesn't seem like a, there's much demand there. But dump to swap on Zvol. So, so you, you, yeah. So, you, so you dump the machine. You can go log in interactively. So, you SSH to your machine that's hung or whatever. And instead of, um, it, it hasn't panicked yet, right? So, and you want to take a core dump and analyze it offline, you can just do. I think it's save core dash L on a Lumos, and it'll just dump out right there. But it never stops the machine. So you might be. You might not have the, the code in, in memory that you want at the time uh, you take the core dump. And also, uh, different things can shift around so your core dump won't be consistent. So, so you might get weird results, but you might get what you want. It's, it's kind of dicey a little bit. That's why I think it's kind of strange. Really? That's, are you guys planning on uh, upstreaming that? Nice. Right. You do which? Oh, nice. Get all that up there. <laughs> Have to upstream that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, just directly to the file system? Nice. Mm. That's how Linux does things, right? Yeah, I remember well, cause, uh, Michael Dexter worked, at, worked with Groupon while I worked there, and this was actually like a, a joke we had for like a day before we found out this was real. But we we're like, well, you could just like start another kernel that works and then use that to dump. And then we we're like, ha ha ha, that's so ridiculous. And then we've come to find out that's exactly how Linux does it. Mm -hmm. How much are you carving out? Um, I'm not sure. I can't okay. Yeah, let me know. It, and if you if you have all that code, like definitely. Uh, yeah, we had the, for the, um, the KXX part, we had something happen first, and then we had something happen post Yeah, that that seems to be sort of the the story with a lot of this, is that every like. Uh, each, each group or company has a feature they, they feel like that they, they're the only ones that need. Like they need it and they're like, eh, we want to upstream this. Like it's kind of weird. Right. Yeah, that might be, that might be more, more so than the compressed dump. But it, it's interesting because everybody, every feature under the sun I think exists, but never in one place. Okay, so the last part of this is actually just to point you at uh, the paper that this talk is based on. Um, if you want to use this for research, the best place to go is the org mode file. So it's .org. Um, it includes like every note I made while creating this paper, and it is pretty extensive. Uh, there's some funny emails in there, like from Jordan Hubbard. Um, you can go find that one. It's mostly just that he can't help me, <laughs> but I just thought it was funny. Um, and it includes the commit messages, emails that I sent back and forth, the code referenced. It includes information not that I felt like wasn't ready for the paper. So Unix v5 is actually where it starts. 
but it's just not um, in the PDF. And other incomplete sections and notes. It includes raw notes and various levels of detail. Uh, code is often included, so you can actually like reference exactly where I got my information, and usually the file path as well. So I, I did, last time I took a look. Uh, let's see how we're doing on time. We got like 15 minutes left, like 10. Um, so yeah, if you, want, if you wanted to go see it, it's pretty easy. GitHub actually doesn't pay attention to the fact that I, I told org mode not to export my notes. So it's, it's pretty easy to read it on GitHub. You can go see things like, um, if you go look up uh, Jordan, yeah. So here's the Jordan Hubbard email. Here's him saying that this whole thing is pretty esoteric, <laughs> which he's totally right about. But other things like that, you can see that I decided not to do Solaris, and I did Lumos instead, things like that. And there's a longer section on uh, backtrace.io and what it's for and how it works. Um, so that's about it. Uh, these are some links that might be relevant. Uh, the first one's the paper. The next one is a really cool Git repo that has the history of FreeBSD merged into all the old Unixes. Um, and then Rod Grimes' status on working on a few of those modules I talked about. Uh, I'd like to thank Deb Goodkin for bringing me into the FreeBSD community. Uh, Rod Grimes for helping read the PDP 11 assembly, among other things, and then Michael Dexter for coming up with this idea and asking me to thank him in HVSDCon. I've kept this in there. <laughs> uh, is there any questions? Uh, if, it's, if it's mentioned in the paper, go ahead and just uh, shut me off. Okay. Um, uh, failure modes that uh, for crashes and and uh, and. Do you, uh, do you find that those failure modes will conflict with uh, uh, compression, uh, uh, dumping to uh, ZFS? Yeah, so that's, that's uh, so the big one. So can you talk about that a little bit, unless it's in the paper? OK, uh, no, it's not in the paper. Um, but that was the fear when we were talking about um, uh, dump to ZVOL, that if you, if you panic because ZFS is like acting up and going crazy, and then you attempt to use ZFS to dump, you might have some issues there. Um, it turns out that it's like not often, that doesn't often like get in the way of you, of you dumping out. That's not the part of the code that screws up. But yeah, you could, you could hose yourself. You could, you could start writing all over the place. When you're, when you're attempting to take your dump, you might start writing over your, your data. But um, I've never heard of it happening. So that doesn't mean it never happens. But <laughs> good so far. Any other questions? <laughs>